Give that hand clap to Jesus right now. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. We are in the house of God in Norwalk, California. That means anything is possible. God's spirit can flow and pour out here. Your prayer can be answered. God can heal your body. God can heal your marriage. God can restore you. God can save you. God can redeem the time. God can repair your ministry. I believe the things that are impossible with men are possible with God. We worship the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. May your spirit pour out an apostolic lighthouse here. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We all say in Jesus' name, amen. What a joy. What a privilege to be here once again with my friends at Apostolic Lighthouse. This was one of my very first revivals in the state of California. So like Paul told one church, ye are my first fruits in Achaia, ye are my first fruits in SoCal. Let's go. I love all of you. You're a blessed church. Can I confess that I used to have an incorrect belief? Don't be scared here. I used to have an incorrect belief. Anybody ever heard the phrase, God can't bless a mess? Ever heard the phrase, God cannot bless a mess? That's wrong. Because God can bless a mess. Because years ago, my life was a mess. And God repaired me, and God put me back together. God blessed this mess right here. And if God can repair and restore and put me back together, he can do the same for you. So whatever the mess is in your life, whatever the mess is that you've gone through, God can bless you. I want you to point that pointer finger at your own self right now and say these words. Say, God can bless me in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hosea chapter 1. I'll be reading the first three verses in the gospel according to Hosea. Yes. Is the gospel message in Hosea? The gospel message is in every book of the Bible. It is the message of salvation. Yes. Do you know what the name Hosea means? In Hebrew, the name Hosea means salvation. So, this man of God, this prophet of the Lord, this man who has a book in the Bible named after him, his name means salvation, and throughout his ministry, there is a cord, a thread of that salvation message. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. I better go ahead and read this opening text. I give honor to my friends, to Pastor Bradley and family. Brother, you're a blessing to everybody here at Apostolic Lighthouse. Sister Bradley, you're a blessing to everyone in Apostolic Lighthouse and all of your family members. Uh, you're a blessing to everyone here. Bless God. Thank you for your ministries in me and to everyone here in the church in Norwalk, California. Hosea chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord that came unto Hosea, the son of Beeri, in the days of... Now, these names shall be important later on, so just make sure you watch these names here. In the days of Uzziah, Yotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. And in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. Verse 2. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go take unto thee a wife of, strong language here, strong language, a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms. For the land hath committed great whoredom departing from the Lord. Verse 3. So he went and took Gomer. Everyone say Gomer. Gomer, Gomer the daughter of Diblaim, which conceived and bare him a son. Now this is not my full message, but I want you to see this. Gomer was messy too. But she was also fruitful. God can be fruitful in your life in the middle of messes. Understand that. God can bring forth fruit from what you thought is a mess. Okay. Do you receive that? Okay. For a few minutes this morning, I'm going to preach to you on the ministry of Hosea. Everybody say the ministry 
of Hosea. Lord, speak to us. Let us have ears to hear what the Spirit saith unto the church. And God, once again, let it not be Joel Reveille who preaches. Let it be you, God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who speaks to us. Open our hearts, open our ears, and stop our ears to hear what the Spirit saith unto the church. And with joy, may we all draw waters out of your well of salvation. Open our minds and our hearts to hear your word this morning. You get all the glory and the credit in heaven above, Jesus. We say in Jesus' name, name. amen. Clap your hands to God as you are seated all across Norwalk, California. The nation of Israel had a division. There were two kingdoms of Israel. There was the kingdom down south that had two of the 12 tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And that kingdom of Judah had the people who were the predominantly saved and sanctified folks. Down in the south, in Judah and in Benjamin, they had the city of Jerusalem. Say Jerusalem. And in the borders of the city of Jerusalem, they had that big giant temple, that big mega church, the house of God, the temple that God had given to King David and then later on to King Solomon to construct. And they built that big beautiful edifice which honored the name of the Lord and the people of the Lord, a place where everybody could come and worship the Lord in truth. That was not where Hosea was, though. Hosea was not in the southern kingdom. He was not in the buckle of the Old Testament Bible belt. He was in the middle of Hollywood land, California. He was in the middle of the northern kingdom, where all of the interesting things happened. Everybody say glory. We are in California this morning. Much like the territory of Hosea, it was filled with people who were not predominantly church folks. The ten tribes of the north is where Hosea prophesied. And these ten tribes of the north, I give it to you as a quote-unquote homework assignment this week. Go and look up the kings of the northern nation of Israel. The kings of that northern nation, it's sometimes called Israel, it's sometimes called Samaria, because they had their capital in Mount Samaria. And sometimes it's called Ephraim, because that capital, Mount Samaria, was in Ephraim. All right, That northern kingdom didn't even have one good king. Look up all the kingdoms in the northern tribe, beginning with King Jeroboam. It never says any of those kings did that which was right. Every king was bad. They had crazy politicians. Got to be careful here. Everybody say glory. Everybody say, I can relate to that. That's as far as I can take that right here. We are live streamed, I think. So they lived in a place with crazy politicians. They lived in a place predominantly filled with non-churched individuals. And that's where God called Hosea to prophesy. Now, I bet Hosea was excited to receive the prophetic word of the Lord. I bet he was feeling wonderful when the Lord began to talk to him. Now, I know preachers who have never heard the audible voice of God. I know individuals in the church who have never heard the audio audible voice of the Lord at any point in their life. And when people do hear the audible voice of God, Oftentimes, it is one of the Mount Rushmore greatest experiences that they ever have in the presence of the Lord. So what did God tell Hosea? He says, you're going to go in verse 2. I'm going to kind of dilute this down. You're going to go and you're going to marry somebody who is an imperfect person. You're going to go and you're going to find a wife who has one of the most interesting jobs you could possibly have in the ancient world. You're going to have someone who is your spouse who has imperfections. That was the first prophetic word he got. It says the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. Huh. I bet he scratched his head and he thought, Did I hear that right from God? 
Have you ever been somewhere in a church and you heard something crazy and you're like, did I hear that right? Did he just say that? I mean, I've been in church all my life. I've heard people say some really humorous and funny things. I've said some humorous and funny things in the pulpit. I can tell stories later on, but I've heard some crazy things. And if you live for God long enough, you might hear a crazy thing or two. I bet he scratched his head and he thought, is that really what God said? to me. But oftentimes I find sometimes the most interesting messages are the ones that are directly for me. Because if God was telling me what I want to hear, he might not be telling me what I need to hear. What I need to hear may not be what I want to hear from God. But all the same, it is from God. Take 10 seconds right now and raise your hands and just receive that whatever God desires to say to me, let me be open to his voice. Let me be open to your leading, even if it's hard, even if it's uncomfortable, even if I think it's unreasonable. Let me receive it from the Lord. Now, while this was going on, there was actually another prophet who lived at the exact same time as Hosea the prophet. Now, if you go back to verse 1 of Hosea chapter 1, it tells you exactly when Hosea prophesied. It was in the time of Uzziah, Yotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Verse 1 tells you that. Now, full stop and pop quiz to all of our biblical scholars here at Apostolic Lighthouse. Does anybody, anyone else here in the house of the Lord, does anyone know any other prophet, any other man of God, any other person or preacher who prophesied during the days of one of those kings? Anyone ever recall this scripture in the year that King Uzziah died? I saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. Anyone ever heard of a man named Isaiah? Isaiah saw visions of God in the year that King Uzziah died. And to make it very plain, look at Isaiah 1 and 1. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amoz, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of... Uzziah, Yotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the exact same king's list. They were contemporary prophets. They were fellow preachers. They prophesied at the same time. But Isaiah's job was vastly different. Isaiah lived in the buckle of the Israelite Bible Belt. He lived in Jerusalem. He lived in the city where the biggest house of God was in the entire nation. He lived for all purposes in the Vatican of the Old Testament. He lived where all the people were all saved and sanctified and experienced the presence of the Lord on a weekly basis. He had the easy job. He had the simple pastorate. Even the kings of Judah themselves loved to hear him preach. You can read about it in the book of Isaiah. King Hezekiah sent for Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah prophesied to politicians. He preached to kings. That didn't happen for Hosea, though. For Hosea, he was relegated to the common man. The politicians were kind of nutty. The politicians and the kings of Israel in the north were sinners. They were pagans. They were not one God believers. They were not practicing believers of the Bible. Hosea tried preaching to the common man, but think about this. Predominantly, it was sinners, so people weren't listening to him. And I bet you, I bet you I know exactly what Hosea thought. He thought to himself, look over here at Isaiah. Isaiah, he's got a great job. He's got a great pastorate. He's preaching to politicians. He's preaching to people who love what he has to say. Give us more. And Hosea, me, I'm preaching to these folks who are pagans and idol worshipers. They don't want to listen to me. My wife don't want to listen to me. The people don't want to hear me. The politicians don't like me. I bet he said to himself, 
that same sentence that all of us say in our private moments. I bet he said, God, that ain't fair. Anybody ever prayed that prayer? Anybody ever prayed, God, why does he have a Cadillac Escalade and I have a Honda CRV and that don't even work right most days? Lord, why do I have the old jalopy and they're driving a Mercedes Maybach or something or a Maybach car? What's going on there, Lord? That ain't fair. And I'll take it even deeper than that. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse number 3. Isaiah's wife was a lady preacher. I believe in lady preachers, by the way. And she was a prophetess. She had visions of God. Isaiah's wife was a lady prophetess. His wife was seeing visions of the Lord. And Hosea's wife was seeing other people. She was experiencing the presence of the Lord in the company of angels while Gomer was experiencing conversation of other men in the presence of other Israelite persons. The comparison could not be more stark. I know he had to have wondered why. Why, Lord, can Isaiah have that? but I have this lot in life. I bet he thought, why is it thus? And so I have come to Norwalk, California to preach to every Hosea, to anyone who has ever prayed that secret prayer, and to everyone who's ever asked the Lord, why? Why is my life like this? Why am I in a mess? Why am I in an imperfect environment? This message is for you. Maybe I'm not preaching to the Isaiahs this morning. Maybe this sermon is simply to the Hoseas, to the imperfect people. That's all of us, by the way, including myself. Maybe this message is to everyone whose life is filled with difficult seasons and discomforts. Maybe you have had some years where you scratched your head and had questions. Why did I get this? Why do I have the rough shake? Why was I dealt this hand? of cards and I've come to preach to you why if you look up in the book of Numbers, you will find numbers of people from every tribe in Israel. In Numbers chapter 1, every tribe of Israel was numbered, including Judah and Benjamin and the other ten tribes. In the southern kingdom of Judah, among the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, there was just over 100,000 people. In the other ten tribes, which, I, which Hosea would have preached to, uh, there was just under about 500,000 people. There was just over 100,000 people across Judah and Benjamin. There was just under 500,000 people in the other ten tribes. 500,000 to 100,000. Five to one. Hosea preached to five times as many people than Isaiah would ever meet in his life. And they were all sinners. They were all unchurched. They were all idol worshipers. Do you realize that Hosea was their only voice of one God preaching in the entire nation for a whole sequence of years? Do you understand that you are the only one God believer that some people in Los Angeles County will ever even meet. Dear Esther, you are called to the kingdom for such a time as this. The city of Norwalk needs you. The people in the northern tribes need you. Your friends need you. You've been called to preach to people who don't have the voice of an Isaiah in their life. In fact, I'm convinced, Pastor Bradley, I'm convinced personally that the North would not have listened to Isaiah the prophet. I can't speak Hebrew, but one of my friends does speak Hebrew, and he tells me that the Hebrew of the book of Isaiah is vastly different from the Hebrew of like Amos and Hosea. From what I comprehend of what my friend told me, the Hebrew of Isaiah is like reading highborn English. It's like reading Shakespearean English, the thus and the these and the thous and the King James Version, you know. And reading Amos, for example, Amos was a farmer. Perhaps the Hebrew of his language was a bit more common. 
How Hosea was a common man. He was a common preacher, and he reached the common people. I don't think Isaiah would have even been able to have a congregation in the north but take a man who had lived among the people. Take a man who was just like them. Whenever he preached, I bet the whole area knew about his problematic marriage. I bet the whole city where he lived knew that his wife was a lady of the evening. I bet they knew the pains that he had endured. And so when he still got his sandals and his robes on and went out with his Bible and preached the Word of God, they knew the pain he endured just to live and preach this truth and yet all the same he soldiered on I bet Hosea reached people by his life and by his example and so all the same there are people that you are reaching by your life and by your example you are preaching the word every day that you live and example this truth Take 20 seconds right now and raise your hand all across this congregation and say, God, let me be an example. God, let me testify to the people around me in my life. God, give me the words to say and what to do to reach my city, my friends, and my family. I am Hosea! <laughs> Hosea's ministry was powerful. That name Hosea means salvation. Salvation ministries are often birthed in the crucible of imperfections, but they shine out as the jewels of God. Let's talk about what Hosea said in his book. Hosea chapter 4. Let me give you three passages very quickly as examples of the kind of ministry that Hosea's can have. Famous scripture. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. How many has heard that verse at least one time in your life? Yeah. I like it. Now normally when we quote that verse, we just quote that first part of it. And we neglect the other scriptures around it. We're not doing that this morning, though. This morning, let me give you the context of that statement. Hosea 4, verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, say truth, nor mercy, nor of God. See, the knowledge of God is connected to the mercy of God and the truth of God. You won't have the knowledge of God without having the mercy of God in your life. If you want to have knowledge of the B-I-B-L-E, if you want to understand this book better, then become a man and a lady of mercy in your life. The more mercy that you receive and the more mercy that you personally give out to other people around you, that is a divine characteristic. Mercy is part of the identity of God. It says it over and over and over again in the Old Testament. For his mercy endureth forever. His mercies are made new every morning. Verse 4, please. Let no man strive nor reprove another for your people are as they that strive with the priest. See, Folks argue with the preacher back then too, Pastor. People argue with preachers back then in the Old Testament as well. Going on, verse 5. Therefore shalt thou fall in the day. This is part of the prophecy that God gave Hosea. Hosea is prophesying to the people. He's saying, therefore shalt thou fall in the day, and the prophet also shall fall with thee in the night. Stop right here. Okay. This is an incredibly deep prophecy. The very next statement in verse 6 is about the knowledge of God. But let me stop right here at verse 5 just for a brief moment and see this. If the preacher falls in the night and the people fall 
in the day. Those are connected umbilical conversations. If the preacher is falling in the night, the people are falling in the day. That's an incredibly deep and nuanced point that what the preacher is doing in private affects what the people will do in public. But now think about this. The man who preached that, the prophet who preached about what the prophet does in the night, the prophet's wife at night was going out and seeing other men. Do you realize how traumatic it was for him to preach that message as he sang those words? The prophet shall fall with thee in the night. As he sang those words, he might have been thinking to himself, and I have no idea where my wife is going to go tonight either. Don't you know under their breath, the people listening in the crowd that day as he prophesied those words were thinking to themselves, yes, and your prophet's wife tonight will be places that you don't even know about, dear preacher. While he was preaching, he had no idea when she would even come home. I bet he spent sleepless nights crying out to God, God, where is Gomer? Where did she go? Where is my wife? And yet all the same, that man still soldiered on and plowed ahead and preached the word. When you know the context of such prophecies, it magnifies his ministry. And so therefore it is that as the people in your life get to know you, your testimony becomes magnified. When they see, you know, I've been around that sister. She never cusses. She never consumes alcohol. I've been around that brother. He never even tells one dirty X-rated joke. Your testimony, the longer you live in front of them, even if you never stand in this pulpit with your two feet, you are standing in the pulpits of their lives every day on the job site. You are standing in the pulpits as an example to them Wherever you go, in the coffee shops, to the people in the Uber rides, when you tell them about what God has done for you, you are being a Hosea in their life. Amen. Hallelujah. Hosea chapter 6 and verse 6. For I desired mercy and not sacrifice. You want to know what's even more important to God than worship? Because sacrifice was basically Old Testament worship and consecration. You want to know what matters to God even more than worship is mercy. Mercy and not sacrifice. And the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Once again, mercy and the knowledge of God are connected ideas. Next verse, verse 7 says, They like men have transgressed the covenant. There have they dealt treacherously against me. All right. To explain verse 6 to you about mercy and not sacrifice, I must now take you and show you that this man, Hosea, was a man who gave mercy on a daily basis. Recall, once again, his wife, Gomer, was going out at night doing her quote-unquote job. Every day, that man chose to take her back. He was giving out mercy on a week-to-week and day-by-day basis, personally, inside of his own house. Isaiah can't preach this message, but Hosea can. Because Hosea was a giver of mercy. And so when those people in his towns, in the surrounding counties, when they heard him preach about mercy, it got to them. Because they knew he was a man of mercy. See, when people know that you are living this, they will listen to you. When they've seen you pray, they can hear you talk about prayer. When they've seen you read your Bible, then they can hear you talk about the Bible. When they've seen you be an example of kindness and joy and love and mercy and compassion and peace, then they can hear you talk about those fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, kindness, meekness, temperance. They can hear you speak about the Word of God when you are living the Word of God. He lived mercy and he preached mercy. You are Hosea and I am Hosea. Yes, we preach mercy. We also live mercy in our daily life. Hallelujah. Final example, Hosea 7. Now, personally, I admit this, this is my favorite 
example of Hosea. Ephraim was the location of Mount Samaria. Mount Samaria was the capital of the nation of the north. The ten tribes in the north had their capital in Samaria in Ephraim. So it's talking about that northern nation of Israel. Ephraim, he has mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Now, got to break this down for you. Years ago, I saw a documentary about Amish baking and cooking. Anybody ever seen Amish people bake cakes or cook things? It's great to watch. So the Amish, they bake cakes by putting that cake on this long handheld wooden spindle and they hold the cake in the fire pit. And then guess what they do next? They turn the cake. So they bake that side of the cake, and they turn the cake on that wooden spindle and bake the opposite side, the fore side of the cake. If you don't turn the cake, the cake is half-baked, and that is the origin of the phrase half-baked, okay? He's saying, Ephraim, you're half-baked. You're part goo, and you're part good. Now, I'm not going to tell you where this happened It comes from an old country store that I ate at years ago that gives biscuits and cornbread. They gave me some biscuits that were half-baked. Everybody say, ugh. I bit into that biscuit, and it was part good and part goo. And I'm like, they didn't finish the biscuits. Where am I? I mean, how hard is it to mess up biscuits? We're looking for intelligent life among the stars, but we should try and find it, you know, in the employment industry sometimes. Moving on. So, he was half-baked. But now consider that that is also a figure of Hosea's life. His life was half-baked. In his marriage, his marriage was half-baked. He was good, and his wife was goo. He was living for God, and she was living out there in the world. He was a house divided, literally. He was anointed, and she was in the world. His whole life was lukewarm. God said, I would that you were hot or cold. He was hot for the Lord, and she was cold in the Lord. The whole thing was a mixed metaphor. The whole thing was a mixed example. And so when the people heard this man utter this prophecy, when they heard this man speak these words, they knew he was living this. His life was a cake not turned. On one side was Hosea, the man of God, and was on the other side of that cake was Gomer going out in the oldest profession, being a woman of the night. But that is not how the story ends. I have two verses to close out with you. And please let me read these verses to you in closing. Hosea 3, verse 1. And the Lord said unto me, Go yet love, everybody say love. On your own time, Flip over to Hosea 1 and check the words of Hosea 1 against these words. In Hosea 1, God told Hosea, go marry a woman of whoredoms. Never said a word about loving her. But now the covenant deepens. See, the longer you live for God, the covenant will deepen. Now don't just marry her. Love her. Go yet love a woman Beloved of her friend. This one hurts. Because if you realize it's Gomer that he's talking about, he's saying, you're going to love her. Now to her, you're just her friend. She friend-zoned her husband. Everybody say, ouch. We're just good friends, honey. I love you. You're a friend. Ouch, honey. Beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress. God admits that she's an adulteress. Do you realize that adultery carried the Old Testament death penalty? According to the Old Testament, adulterers and adulteresses got stoned. And God says, you're going to forgive her. 
See, that, that woman that God pardoned of adultery in John chapter 8 was not the first adulteress that the Lord pardoned. God has been pardoning sinners and redeeming lives for thousands of years. That was just one case in the Gospel of John when Jesus stopped the stoning of that adulteress. He already did the exact same thing basically with Gomer here 800 years earlier. God has always been a forgiver of sins. God has always been a redeemer of broken lives. That's who he is. He is, always has been, and always will be a God of mercy. She's an adulteress. According to the love of the Lord, you're going to love her. You're going to love her, even though she's been messy. And you're going to tell Israel to look to no other gods and not love flagons of wine anymore. So he does this in verse 2. It's a quick reference. So I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver. He gives the purchase price. We don't know what she did that got her into a mess. He never explains it. But by our best comprehension, for him to have to buy her back, that most likely means that she got herself into heavy debts and was about to be sold into slavery. We don't know the series of events in the sequence of time that got her into that mess. Hosea never tells us. So hear me. He never runs her down. She made terrible mistakes that got herself into this situation. And he never runs her through the mud. Because once God forgives someone, we don't talk about their past. We don't talk about all the bad things that they went through before they got to the house of God. It's as far as the east is from the west. No, God paid the purchase price. We don't speak of that anymore. Now they are in covenant with the Lord. God is our example, and God gives Hosea the example here. You're going to go and buy her back. He buys her back, never talks about the bad things she did. In verse 3, this is beautiful. I told her, now you're going to abide for me many days. Now your old life is over. And now you won't be for any other man, and I'll be your husband only for you. You know what? Hosea got his happy ending. She stayed with him. He got to ride off in the sunset with Gomer. God gave Hosea his happy ending. And that's a figure of Israel. He was telling Hosea that Israel would also get their happy ending. Hosea got his ride off into the sunset. He got his happiness. Israel was going to come back together. They were going to get their happy ending too. And just like Hosea and just like Israel, God has not abandoned you. You will get your happy ending too. Stand all across this room. And just like God pardoned Gomer, God is telling you, abide here many days. Your old life is done. You won't be for the other things in the world. You won't be for anyone else who desires to use you and use your future years. No, you're going to be for the Lord and he will be for you. He will be your husband. He will be your God. He will be in covenant with you. He will make the agreement. He will guide your life. He will steer the vessel of the future ahead. He's the captain of the gospel ship. He's in control of your life. Final verse, Hosea 14, verse 4. I will heal their backsliding. See, healing, yes, is the healing of the body. But I also personally believe that the spiritual gift of healing is not just body healing. I also believe the gift of healing in the New Testament is also emotional healing and mental healing and spiritual healing. I believe that God will heal your mind and God will restore your heart and God will stitch back together the broken places and pieces of you and your previous years. I believe that the great physician above will suture your wounds and put you back 
back together. He says, I will love them freely, unconditional love. My anger is turned away. God's not going to be mad at you. God's going to love you unconditionally. That's the beauty of the Lord. The unconditional love. It's coming. You've got better years coming. You've got freedom coming. You've got healing coming. You've got peace and joy coming. You've got divine love coming to you. All across this room, these altars are open. And I invite everybody at Apostolic Lighthouse to leave the chairs and come to the front here for a time. As you make your way, I want you to make this revival resolution. I want you to pray, Lord, I receive that I am Hosea. My life has a purpose. I'm preaching to people. I'm living my life in front of people who need what we have. They need the Holy Ghost. They need Acts 2.38. They need the gospel message of repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. I want to reach my lost loved ones. I want to reach my family members. I want to reach my co-workers and my friends, my classmates and school friends. I'm Hosea. Maybe I have had marriage problems and difficulties. Maybe my house has had tumultuous seasons of time. But God can fix that too. Just like God repaired Gomer, God can restore my marriage. God can redeem my home and my loved ones. God can reach my babies. God can talk to my children. God can speak word and peace and kindness to all the members of my household. Love is coming. Restoration is coming to everyone that I care about. I'm Hosea. I'm reaching people that Isaiah never could. Maybe the people I am reaching in my life are imperfect. That's exactly true because this is not the ministry of the perfect. This is the ministry of Hosea. I am reaching the Samaritan. I am reaching the Israelite and the northern tribe. The ones whose lives are messy. The ones pushed around by culture and by Hollywood and politicians. But all the same, I can reach them. They will meet me. I will preach to them. I will teach Bible studies to their family. I will tell them that God loves them. I'll be a giver of mercy because God gave mercy to me. I am Hosea, I'm a minister of salvation, and I want to help somebody else receive salvation of the Lord.